Okay, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, hopefully we've got a good audience. And thank you all for attending today. Uh, I think I'm going to kick off as long as I get the, the thumbs up from my technical people. Yep. Okay, we're good to go. And I hope you can all see the screen. So I will kick off. Okay, so um, some PowerPoint, but mostly uh, software demo is the idea today. So not too much of me talking in PowerPoint, hopefully. But I'll, I'll kick off in PowerPoint here. Okay, so uh, first of all, to very quickly introduce SNT, I'm sure a lot of you know us already, but just to remind ourselves that um, we do, we're well known for our CAE software, master software, uh, but we also do technical engineering services. So um, I've worked in both divisions and I'm sharing with you today uh, my experiences in, uh, in project work, NVH work, as well as the software. Uh, okay, so there's a quick introduction to myself. There's my face, so you know, if you've not met me, uh, what I look like. Uh, a kind bio written by somebody, uh, just to say that it's been, uh, it's been nearly 20 years this summer, modeling and analyzing gearboxes. Very often, NVH, NVH has been a problem for a long time. Uh, a lot of history, but where we are now, uh, I'm very proud of what we've got at SMT, a, a, a beautiful CE tool in master hopefully matching the, the new challenges. So NBH, in fact, the challenges have, have increased with the EV and HEV technologies becoming uh, very current today. Um, so just for today, relatively informally, I'm gonna demonstrate the sort of the workflow using software of how we troubleshoot gear wine issues. Um, the same workflow could be used in a modified way if you're in concept design or detail design, you don't have any test data, you don't necessarily have a problem, uh, I think you'd use a similar approach, but you would be wanting to um, compare to benchmark results for, for simulation because you wouldn't have any test data. Okay, uh, so I'm just going to open or bring up the master model. Uh, so I'm going to use a relatively simple model, but an important model. This is a, an EV, an electric vehicle drivetrain. I'm sure a lot of you are aware of. This is a simple version, two stages. We're just about to see sort of the evolution into maybe two-speed and more complicated models, but for the demonstration purposes, this is a, a good one to use. Okay, uh, so I've got the master model open and ready. However, uh, I'm not gonna look at it first, just to remind us what we've got. Uh, it's, a, it's a high speed gear mesh followed by a lower speed gear mesh uh, motor at the input end, outputs at the wheels. Uh, okay, so, as I said, I think for me, if you're, if you're troubleshooting, if you have an NVH problem, um, the very first thing you need to look at is your test data, very carefully to identify and quantify your problem. Uh, so often if you're a, a CAE analyst, you may just be presented with a, just a report of the, the NVH issue. I think it's important to push for um, either a good discussion with the NVH test engineer or on our projects we would push for raw data so we can reanalyze it and really understand and see some of the, some of the clues into what, the, what is causing the NVH problem is in the test data to really focus your analysis work. Uh, okay, and just a little chat about what we use. Um, so we have our own software for CAPTCHA, which is a national instruments based uh, hardware uh, and data acquisition. Uh, we've written our own analysis tool, uh, which we call Measure, the whole package we call Measure in fact relatively lightweight but very focused on geared systems in the same way as master isn't a general CA package it's um, very much focused and therefore strong for the geared systems uh, and then we have, a, we have a link to master which I'll demonstrate which allows quick transfer of the, the key uh, order excitation information from your your mechanical model into your test data so you can start to identify which components are are causing the trouble or the problem uh, and it's a preparatory, so we, we, uh, we can do any further developments we need. For example, as we go into the, the hybrid driving, the, the order analysis isn't gonna be a straight line. We've got two different varying input speeds, quite complex to analyze. Uh, if we've got it in our own software, we're in control. Uh, this, this slide is slightly ambitious or ahead of the, ahead of the game from our marketing people. The, the, the data interchange is, is good from master into measure, as I'll show you. Uh, we're still sort of thinking about whether to bring test data from test, from measure, or any other system 
back into master. I think that would be in future plans and that would allow very um, quick uh, check of test versus simulation in master itself if you could bring in, for example, accelerometer data. But uh, that's for the future, not today. Uh, okay, so I'm going to open uh, some test data to have a quick look at. Uh, so this is our measure software. Uh, so this is actually um, this is a road test on uh, a Nissan Leaf. So I have to be very careful never to share or, or show publicly, uh, you know, confidential data from projects. But this is uh, our own testing of a of a Leaf, so I can show you this. There's no confidentiality issues. Uh, as a consequence, it's not very not so interesting. It doesn't have a problem, but it's also interesting as a benchmark example. Um, so what you can see here is the is the microsome pressure, which isn't very interesting yet, just versus time. Have a little look at the uh, at the speed signal. <coughs> uh, uh, okay, we won't look at the speed signal. Ah, uh, I can. Right, uh, I can't show you the speed, the speed signal because it slightly interferes with the recording software, but uh, we're okay to carry on. Uh, so, yes, this is just pressure, so clearly uh, it would be better to look at this in on a dB scale, which you'll all then recognise. Uh, so, uh, a classic waterfall plot. Uh, and as I said, it's, it's, it's useful to be able to interrogate this yourself and not just rely on somebody else's report. So immediately we can see this is, a, this is a, a nicely refined vehicle, not too much in the way of orders, uh, certainly not at high speed, but immediately we would like to sort of zoom in a little bit, uh, maybe to 3000 hertz. Uh, and then maybe I can see a little bit of an order line here and here. Uh, so at this point I would use the, the link to master, so I can actually import uh, orders which are generated by master. So I've done this before. These are the leaf input orders with respect to the input speed. Uh, open. Uh, and you can see they're nicely overlaid now. And I'll just um, remove a few we're not interested in. We're really just interested in the gear meshes today. So I'm just going to uh, remove those, just get us down to just the gear meshes. So you can immediately see where the, the second stage is and a little bit of a maybe possible noise here. Uh, and where the, the first stage is. So, uh, nice refined vehicle, not too much of an issue. Interesting to note, this is the road noise, and second stage is already potentially masked uh, by the road noise. Uh, important to look at the order cuts, which is often what you receive when there's a problem. Uh, so here you can see the, the order cuts of the, the gear stages. Uh, this second stage is probably cutting through and picking up uh, a lot of road noise, actually. Uh, but the the order 17 is, is, is kind of realistic. Uh, maybe I'll just pop that one on by itself. Uh, um, so we can start to see what's going on. If there was a problem, we'd identify it here first in the noise. Uh, then the point would be to look at uh, accelerations. So in this case, I've got two accelerometers. Um, Maybe theoretically one sometimes expects to see a lot. I think in practice on a real road test, you're not gonna get that many, but you're gonna get a couple at least. Uh, so now we're looking at the vibration. This is just loading up. DB scale isn't the right scale to use for vibration. So I'll change it to uh, the raw scale. Uh, this is a little exaggerated, uh, so I can really see what's going on. Uh, maybe I'll make that a little less. So this is in uh, meters per second squared. So around about 1G would be really good for an EV, which is 10 meters per second squared. Uh, so uh, you can see that the meshes are in there. Uh, I'll have a little look at the order cuts. Uh, and I'll put, the, I'll put the second stage back in. Uh, maybe I'll put in some harmonics. Uh, you can start to see, and I'll, I'll maybe change the scale back a little bit to maybe five. Uh, so you can start to see the vibration in the gear meshes, uh, and as an order cut, uh, I'll just chart settings. Uh, I don't think we need to see the total. Uh, you can start to see what's going on. Uh, with the various orders uh, and how much vibration we've got 
Uh, so just what I wanted to give you a very brief overview is, is, a, is a good idea to have a good stare at your, your test data and often just one waterfall part plot isn't enough. Maybe to finish off I'll kind of show you something a little bit more dramatic. Maybe if we look at the, the full frequency domain uh, and I bring out uh, the scale, uh, you can start to see the gear meshes, uh, potential resonances, and here you can see some of the some of the vibration caused by the electric motor. This is the pulse width modulation of the sort of the control frequency, uh, and uh, this is 24, uh, and this is 48. So. Uh, just a good look at the test data uh, is where you need to start your troubleshooting uh, to really establish first where your your noise problem is by looking at the noise and, and checking with that with the subjective assessment and where the passenger believes there's a problem and then trying to identify in the acceleration data um, if you can correlate the noise to the acceleration data and then you can go into the master model uh, and start to correlate the master model to the vibration. Okay, I think that's probably all I have to say about the test data. We need to spend plenty of time on Maxton today. Okay, so just a little bit of a roundup in my PowerPoint. Uh, this is what we're looking at, the, the driver's ear in a refined vehicle. Uh, you can still, as I said, pick out the odd point where you think, hmm, I, maybe I can hear the gear mesh there. Uh, and it's quite a, uh, a hot topic in the in the industry at the moment as to, you know, how much uh, noise associated with the gear mesh is acceptable. So this little blip here uh, is actually slightly above 35 dBA. So there's been sort of discussions about, uh, you know, what is the limit. Uh, I think it very much depends on where you you put your mesh in a sense. If you've got lots of road noise around it, like the second stage here, uh, you're unlikely to hear that. Uh, interesting for the leaf. Uh, here, pinion has 17 teeth, so it's quite low frequency. You know that this first stage is 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 quite near the road noise. If you were to go up to a higher tooth number for the pinion, you might be out here uh, in a region where there'd be much less masking uh, in frequency terms. Okay, uh, just thought I'd throw in another example with a very significant noise because that leaf wasn't very interesting uh, just to show that you know you really can see this is this is noise this is decibels this is actually a a bus application you really can see the gear orders sort of standing out here and I can see a little bit of a resonance here which is where I would then want to focus my my analysis work uh, even more extreme this is from a test rig you can see some very very clear resonances here whenever the the meshes hit the resonance uh, Actually, this rig sounded horrible at that point. Uh, uh, okay, so that's probably as much as I should do on test data. Uh, so now I'm going to get into the, the bulk of today's presentation or, or demonstration, which is a, a master demo. Uh, there's an awful lot of functionality in, in master, so I'm just going to try and pull out uh, those features and those functionalities which are most relevant to NVH. Uh, and in that process, give you a sort of workflow as to how you use master to, to address these NDH issues and, and gear wine in particular. Okay, so uh, oh, I think I'm supposed to open the master model again now. Uh, okay, okay, so here it is. We're back here in master. Uh, so if I was addressing an NVH problem, how would I, how would I start work? Okay, so the, the first thing I would look at is I would review the design. This may have been built by somebody, a bearing analyst or a gear analyst for looking at durability. So I need to be careful as I, as I move into the NVH analysis that I update my model to be the best fidelity and accuracy for, for NVH. Uh, so I'll just pull out a couple of, of quick points. Uh, I think we need to see uh, yeah, the whole design. Uh, so the first thing it, that is critical is our upstream and bound, downstream boundary conditions, which is our, our power load going out. Uh, so the critical property here to check up on always is the, the downstream torsional stiffness. So in this case, it's very high. Uh, we, that's the default value for master. 
we can't guess or anticipate the user's downstream upstream conditions so we just go for grounded um, so in this case it's not too bad we've modeled some of the half shafts there's probably some more half shaft so maybe there's a little reduction in the in the in the the stiffness here is maybe not quite grounded but that's not too bad uh, and the same on the other side uh, however at the at the input end we must be more careful so I've not modeled the whole rotor here uh, you can I've got other models with the motor in but for this simple demo model I haven't so we must be careful of the the input boundary condition so here you can see I've, I've set the torsional stiffness to zero this is effectively modeling the motor we're not mechanically grounded so we should have zero torsional stiffness there um, I could add some polar inertia on the power load or I find to make things easier I've just put the, the polar inertia corresponding to the rotor which is very significant as an input here as a mass disk as a 0 0.68 so I think uh, I, I kind of would emphasize that that inertia there is quite critical for these EV applications uh, so you, you need to make sure you've got a, a fairly accurate representation of the of the the rotor inertia that will affect the whole drivetrain dynamics from then on in okay so that's the the first thing i checked design wise uh, next the sort of fidelity of the model um, you can see here we've modeled the the gear blank which could be quite thin using fe uh, and i'll show us throughout this presentation that's that can be important that can have a, a very significant effect on the dynamics uh, so to look at that in a little bit more detail, I can skip to the imported FE functionality. Uh, you can actually see in this model I've I've got um, this is the model setup. This is the, the gear blank. I've got a 10 millimeter blank. I've got a 15 millimeter blank, and I've got a 30 millimeter blank. So we can do a little bit of a, a sort of study just in this model of different blank designs. Uh, and then whilst we're here for dynamics. It's always a good idea to have a little look at the fundamental modals. So this automatically calculates the mode shapes of this component in, uh, in isolation at this point, just as a, as a component, so ungrounded. So if you have a look here, the first six modes will be more or less zero frequency, give or take the numerics, and then mode seven will be what we're interested in. So if I uh, view this, uh, it's, well, it's quite dramatic in fact. Uh, so this um, is the first mode of vibration of the blank, uh, and it's a it's a it's a classic mode which has been identified for some time. Some people call it a a potato chip mode. Uh, so we'll bear that in mind. That's important for the future, and it's around about five point six, five point seven. There's two of these, in fact, uh, kilohertz, and then the, the further up are up to ten kilohertz, which is probably not so relevant. Um, of course, if we have a, a thicker blank, uh, and I look at that mode again, uh, same mode is still present, but now we're up to 11 kilohertz, and hopefully that's kind of way out of our operating range. Uh, so, giving you a little bit of an overview of the importance of, of modeling your FE carefully, uh, we have a casing model in here, uh, which is important as well. Okay, uh, so I'm just gonna go back to the, the design mode. Uh, I think we've we've shown most of what we need to show there. So uh, the next step would be to look at the. Uh, probably I'll have a quick look at the load cases. Um, uh, it's interesting. Just on the main inputs. Uh, so I've made a. We have all sorts of load cases. I've looked at 100% load here. EV often 100% load is important. You must remember, of course, to do regenerating load on the coast flank. Uh, so I've got, uh, actually I've got a couple of, well, three load cases set up with the, the different FE. So there's a property in master called the active FE, and we can flip between the different FEs. So that's helpful in this study. Um, quick check of the, the bearing inputs I wanted to bring up now. Um, these, uh, this model, uh, the actual shafts are quite short, quite a short span. So it's important to note that if you've got any error and you will have some sort of error in your um, the location of your bearings in the casing, which is probably two halves. Uh, you should be careful about that. So you can actually input those as load cases, or you could do a uh, parametric study to have a look at the effect of those errors 
on your analysis. And I'll mention that again later, but I'll just bring it up now that it's important to note that. Okay, so that's the load cases. Uh, next, we'll go on to the power flow. Uh, I'll just, it's already been run, but I'll run it again just so you make sure that I'm being honest and you can see the proper speed at which it runs. Uh, so this is a power flow, quite simple, input to output. Uh, so I just wanted to bring up out here that little link to measure for, store, for starters. So top level reports, we can look at this critical report, which is the, for NDH anyway, is the component passing orders. Um, so you can see this is with respect to the input power load at a speed of 3,500. Uh, the first gear set, uh, 26 teeth, which will mean its first order with respect to the input is, is 26. And you can notice already that the, the tooth passing frequency is 1.5 kilohertz. This model, I think, is, is representative of something which, which operates up to 12, 13,000 RPM. So you can imagine that this first harmonic, the tooth passing order of the first gear mesh, is four, four and a half, five, getting close to those gear blanks already. So it was important we got those blanks in there. Uh, the, the second gear set, as we saw in the test data, uh, is always lower speed, 25 teeth, but its speed is scaled down from the input, so its order, in effect, is 11. Um, and we do give all the, uh, the bearings as well. Uh, and then there's a little button here, export XML to measure, which is what I, I used earlier to bring the, uh, bring the orders into the measure, into the test data. Uh, fairly simple in this example. You could hand count these orders, no problem, obviously, if the example is more complex. Uh, it's it's kind of nice and helpful to have that little export. Okay, so our, our workflow is we've had a look at the power flows, we've had a look at got an idea of the, the orders and the frequencies. Uh, so next of all, we would look at the static analysis. Oh, no, I wouldn't, actually. Uh, yeah, I would, I think. Static analysis. It doesn't matter what order we do these two next tasks in. Uh, so I'd look at the static analysis, which is system deflection. So again, I will, I will run this. Uh, so quite a simple model, but we've got some housing and FE, still pretty quick with our technology. Uh, so first thing to look at here is, um, this is the whole model. Uh, maybe I want to just look at the, uh, the internals to keep things a little clearer. Uh, so uh, just the first thing to check is how the whole, how the whole system deflects, which has probably been done a little bit or early in the design, uh, so I'll, but I'll just have a little look here. Uh, so really, um, this has got quite high helix angles, quite high axial loads. The, the shafts and the gears are being moved quite a lot in the axial direction. Not very much bending. As I said, these are quite short shafts, uh, quite large bearings. So not that much bearing, not that, mu that much bending of the, of the, of the shafts. Uh, it's probably more the, the tolerancing on the casing that uh, maintains the the shaft, which is more important, uh, and the critical result we're looking at is the is the misalignment of the gear mesh. Uh, so this gives me an idea of how misalignment might happen. It doesn't look like very much, and then if I just go to the top level uh, and look at the report, uh, I can zoom in on the. Ah, I actually I had a slightly different way I wanted to do it. Uh, there's lots of different ways we can do things in Master. Uh, I actually think I'll look at the misalignment for all three blanks. So gear mesh, gear mesh misalignment results. Uh, so this is with our thin blank, slightly thicker and thickest blank. Uh, and this number here is the, is the total gear mesh misalignment, which is quite important. Uh, and you can see the, the thin blank is having a, uh, an effect. It's allowing the, the gear to misalign slightly more, but I, I'd be comfortable with this because it's, it's 5 microns over 30 microns face width uh, and this is at full load so not excessive misalignment. Uh, not that surprising as I said there's quite um, short uh, shaft spans uh, and it's probably more tolerancing and, and assemblability which will affect your gear mesh misalignments. But if you're troubleshooting this is certainly an area you should look at first. Okay, so I think that gets us most of the way through static analysis. Uh, the next step in the process, as I said, if, is uh, if you're re reviewing and troubleshooting, is to revisit your gear macro geometry design. 
with respect to NVH. Um, I'm not a gear designer, um, and we could have a whole extra webinar or a future webinar on, on gear design. I think we've already had a, a webinar on uh, design space, space search tools we have for optimizing gears. Uh, but as a quick review, um, as I've noticed, 26 teeth, um, quite high. Uh, probably the reason why is this has been designed for low noise and the, the critical numbers we'd be looking at would be the, the contact ratios. As I've said, gear design is a, is a whole new topic, but just to note, this is where you'd look first, have a look at your contact ratios. These actually look okay-ish to me. Um, <coughs> contact ratios sort of give you a, a, an indication of the NVH performance. So I think that is most of what we need to see on the, on the gear design. Uh, just whilst I'm here, I will just bring up the what is the FE model, which we make locally. Ah, I can't show it you. Yes, I can. No, no, I can't. That's a shame. Okay, we build a local FE model, uh, which is a mesh of the gear to be used in the micrometry and LTCA analysis. Uh, I just wanted to show it you here that we don't model the blank again. So we model the blank in the FE, we don't model it in the, the FE model of the teeth, uh, but we are hoping to put these two together at some point in the future to have a really high fidelity model, uh, which will have the, the LTCA, the system deflection, and the imported FE all put together. Okay, uh, next step, micro-geometry. Uh, uh, ah. So... Uh, Uh, as I said, we have a, a couple of different calculations, a basic and advanced. Advanced uses a full FE mesh to model the deflection of the teeth. Um, it's pretty quick on a, on a model computer, and because our software guys have worked very hard at it. Uh, so I'll just, uh, that's what I will use, the advanced LTCA. Uh, so this is uh, calculating the, the condition of the, the mesh and the teeth under load. Okay, as I said, not, not too long. Uh, LTCA results. Ah, what should we look first? I'll look at the uh, maybe look at the 3D just to remind us what's going on here. Uh, we're, we're we're looking at how the load distribution changes um, as we go through the meshing cycle. Uh, so, uh, as we probably all know, different numbers of teeth are in contact, jumping from four to three, I think. Uh, uh, and the important result of that is the TE. Uh, so um, I'll just set this back to how it would look as default. Uh, so our, probably what we've heard of, our, our criti critical parameter here is our, is our transmission error. Uh, so as we go through that meshing cycle, uh, the, the effective stiffness of the teeth changes as we jump from, it was five to four in fact. Uh, so we get a, a change in the, in the transmission error which is measured in, in microns. Um, and here, peak to peak 0.3, I might have a little look at amplitude as well, first harmonic. So it's, it's been designed for low, low noise. Uh, just going back quickly. Um, I think I'll just point out whilst I'm here that uh, you can also look at the moment about the center. So. Uh, this is an important sort of advanced simulation we do that you can actually calculate the, the change in the moments about the centre as we go through the meshing cycle. So as we, as we saw in the 3D view, the, the lines of action change. And in fact, if you add up all those forces, your moments about the centre won't be constant, but will, will change slightly. So we've got a variation. So in fact, many people for many years have used the transmission error uh, as an excitation. There's another excitation here, which is the excitation by this changing moment. Uh, so we've seen that in uh, some EV problems actually, if you've got a large tilting mode of one of the shafts, that can be quite sensitive to this misalignment as an excitation. Uh, whilst we're here, we should have a little look at the, the contact chart. So um, uh, it may not have been very optimised for a demonstration model, but at least it's, it's fairly central. Uh, if, we'd, um, if we'd got large misalignments and hadn't managed to correct it correctly, we might be seeing a, a poorer contact patch and potentially poorer transmission error. Uh, 
Okay, uh, I think that's most of what we need to look at on the microgeometry. Uh, just had a quick look at the question. That's okay. Uh, okay, so that's all the microgeometry. We've looked at the TE, uh, the, the, the important excitation. Uh, just to pick up a little bit on the, the misalignment excitation, uh, we'll have a little look at um, advanced system deflection. So uh, this is a, a model which uh, runs um, a number of system deflections. So this, this sort of relaxes the assumption that the misalignment is constant throughout that meshing cycle. So it's going to allow the misalignment to, vein, to, to, to vary. So effectively, we've, we've combined the static analysis and the, the LTCA calculation. Um, so you can see indeed here on the bottom, the misalignment does actually vary as we go through the mesh. Uh, so this we can then use as an excitation. We, we excite the dynamic model by the transmission error, which is a displacement excitation. Uh, we can also use this misalignment as an excitation. As I said, that can be, that can be important. Okay, so I'm whizzing along at a fair pace, probably slightly too quickly. Uh, so now we get to the, the sort of most important results, the actual prediction of the NBH, uh, which, for which we use the gear wine analysis. Um, you've seen we've, we've built um, a, a static analysis model. We can now just combine that with the mass of all these components and the dynamic condensation of the casing uh, to, to, to calculate the dynamic modes of the full system. So I've just run this first, a couple modal, uh, again, just to make sure we understand that it's, it's nice and quick. Uh, so we get the modes of the system, uh, and there's a lot of them. I think this is worth a critical point to emphasise. If I were to look at natural frequencies of this model, which isn't even that complicated, uh, up to 7 kilohertz, which might be interesting, there are, there are 86 modes. So there's a lot of modes to look at. So I'm going to try and bring out, as I, as I continue the demonstration, how you understand the modes, how you understand which modes are for important for dynamic analysis, uh, with a sort of methodology. So I'll go back to the 3D. As I said, there's a lot of modes. You can look at them uh, in isolation. Uh, this is the E drive. Uh, I just zoom in and scale up a little bit. Uh, I've just picked one at random, mode 10. Uh, we can see it's, um, it's a fully coupled mode of the system. Um, there's a lot of torsional mode of the, the input shaft, uh, some axial mode, quite complicated. As I said, I could, I could flick through these and we would see a great many different mode shapes. Um, <coughs> of course, if you've got a very particular frequency in your test data, where you've got a mode that you know is a problem, you could have a look here and, and potentially find it and understand what makes that, that resonance and then think about design changes. Um, however, in a little more detail, one would go on to the gear wine stroke harmonic excitation analysis. Uh, so uh, I'll just bring up the run and it'll give us some options. Yeah, here we go. So um, this is where we, we excite the whole model, that dynamic model, by, uh, in this case, the, the transmission error from the two gear sets. Um, and we've got a lot of options. So basic LTCA, advanced LTCA. I've, I've shown you advanced LTCA. It runs nice and quickly. That's just a difference in the TE calculation. Um, if we use advanced system deflection, that will be, mean we will include that misalignment excitation that I was just talking about, which can be important in some models. So I, I would normally run the more advanced calculation first. It's not always important, but I think it's probably not right to, to, to assume it's never important. Uh, a few more options are user specified if you've measured your transmission error uh, on a test rig or, or by test you could input it. A um, little bit something we're working on, we haven't quite released this yet, is a, is a transfer path analysis. So in this case you actually excite it by a, a unit force and we're actually getting the transfer path or the, the FRF from the gear mesh to any point on the model, the, the casing, etc. And I'll, I'll refer to that a little bit later. So that's an option. Just for demo purposes, I'll, I'll run the most simple one. Okay, and we'll run the analysis. Okay, so it is quite complicated, but we've, we've got a pretty quick model. 
uh, but understanding it is maybe a little bit more complex. So I'll, I'll give you my methodology, or our methodology. Uh, the first critical thing to look at <coughs> is the dynamic mesh force. So this is the, the mesh force that is dynamically generated from that static TE. So it's how the system responds to that TE, generating these forces at the mesh, which will then propagate out to excite the bearings, to excite the casing. So understanding this is one of our, our first critical tasks. Uh, and this example, uh, you can see there's a peak uh, in the mesh force at around about uh, 4.4 kilohertz. I could quickly remove the log scale and it would be even clearer. I've got a, a bit of a peak here. Uh, so um, I would say master runs pretty quickly. You could just move on straight to casing acceleration at this point but you'd be almost using it as a, as a black box calculation. I think it's better to understand the mechanism of what's going on, and that will allow you to, to have a better idea of how to, how to tune the model, how to make design changes. Uh, so, as I said, uh, a high mesh force at 4.4, well, why? We need to understand why. So if I flip back to the log scale, uh, we can see the what are called the compliances uh, a little more carefully here. So we, we excite the model and this is a, a relatively standard methodology using the, the static transmission error as a displacement excitation. Um, and to do that, we, we break the model into two halves. We call it the uncoupled model. Uh, so we have a pinion side and a wheel side. And we calculate the dynamic compliance of each side independently. You can see it here. Uh, and then we add these two compliances together, and that allows us to generate the mesh force. Uh, so you can see here where we get the, the peak is where the compliances have crossed, they're about equal, and critically they're 180 degrees out of phase. Uh, so they're going to more or less cancel. So that means we've got a very, uh, a very uncompliant system and we're trying to squeeze in that transmission error. So that generates a high mesh force. So that is the first thing to take away. Uh, that's how the mesh force is generated. Uh, then we have to understand the, the compliance. So it, it's all done here for you. Um, understanding the compliance and where it crosses, and if you want to tune this, you need to understand the peaks. And in fact, as I said, you've got a lot of modes, but there aren't so many which actually generate the peaks. So in this model, there aren't so many which control, there are only a small number actually which control the critical dynamics. So uh, we're getting well for time, so I'll, I'll just start to show you some of them. So as I said, around about 22, there's a big peak here on the pinion side. So to get to the uncoupled mode, this is with respect to the first gear set, we would click on the first gear set, uh, and I would look at the 3D view, and I just need to remember what we're looking for. Oh, I'll forget. 21 or 22. So if I go into the 3D view, uh, and I look at mode 22, uh, ah, yes, so it it's kind of becomes clear now. That was a real crit critical part controlling the, the pinion side compliance. Uh, and it is actually a torsional mode of the input shaft, uh, which is what you might expect. Uh, so that's important. Uh, so if you flip back to the dynamic mesh forces, you can see that was the most compliant bit. It's actually controlled by the, the torsional stiffness of the pinion. Uh, so it's an area you could think about tuning and modifying. Obviously there's lots of other design constraints. That, that pinion is designed for strength from torsional loads and, and, and bending loads, but you understand there's, a, there's an option there. Uh, have a little look at here at uh, mode 31. Uh, well, we've got the scales a little high. Uh, and again, it, it, it makes sense. That this was on the pinion side, uh, and it's uh, a little bit more clear. It's actually, uh, ooh, I think it's an axial mode. Axial? Oh no, it's not. It's a, it's a tilting, slightly tilting or radial load moment or mode, uh, bouncing on one of the bearings. So if you wanted to influence that, you could think about the, the bearing or the shaft design. Uh, Okay, so going back to the dynamic mesh force, um, I can pick out something 
this crossing point is happening down about here. So if I want to make some, some changes here, these modes here may be important. Uh, so the mode just above uh, 5.6 kilohertz. So that's, that may ring a bell if you've been listening. Uh, let's have a little look at what's happening at 5.6 kilohertz, which is um, mode 66, I think. Uh, uh, oh, gosh, there we go then. Uh, it's our friend, the potato chip. Uh, so this is the, the, gear, the gear blank mode. Not in isolation, it's connected to everything else in the model. Uh, but it's, it's controlling the, the wheel side compliance. So if I animate that again, uh, you can see that's all on the wheel side and it's giving us some compliance. Uh, so if I go back to the dynamic gear mesh forces, uh, that's around here uh, at about 5.6. So you can start to see what controls and how you can change this. So that is why I've got pre-prepared some, some different blanks differences. So if I were to then flip to the the 15 millimeter blank, which is a, a thicker blank, uh, hopefully you can see that those modes have moved. Uh, and therefore this crossing point has moved and therefore the gear mesh force has been significantly changed uh, and if we look at the, the even thicker blank uh, it's been even further changed so um, this has been well known for a while in EV applications that these gear blanks give you an option to, to tune and to try and reduce gear mesh forces uh, and we need to check whether that will reduce um, forces going onto the bearings and then into the casing uh, so I'll sort of start to move on next. Uh, so as I said, uh, the high gear mesh force here uh, does that actually transfer itself out into the into the bearings and into the casing? Uh, so there we would look at the uh, just find it. We would look at the bearings. We could look at the dynamic response. Uh, so we generate a, a waterfall plot. I've, I've set this up around about the right speed range. So as I said, we may go up to 14,000 RPM. And indeed, that high force is, is coming out as a, as a bearing load here. Uh, you can see um, it is got a lot of harmonics here. But if I just do one harmonic, that is the, the first stage mesh, and it's starting to generate load. Uh, that would generate um, velocity, similar magnitude, uh, and acceleration. Uh, slightly more detail, you can look at it as an order cut. So we're getting back towards where we started. It would be the order cut in the test data where we would like to, uh, to sort of validate. This is for a bearing. Um, in a bigger model, I would have uh, a casing and accelerometer modes on the casing. I'll probably bring up a slightly bigger model towards the end. Uh, and of course, we can look at the different blanks. So I can flip to a different blank uh, and it's kind of radically changed. Uh, so that is quite a lot of software demo done really quickly. Uh, obviously it's, it's, ah, I've got some questions. Uh, have to, it's difficult to try and read <laughs> uh, what's going on. I may have to answer them afterwards. Uh, can I see the curve T versus roll angle? I think you can. I think I'm going to park the questions and keep going for a little while. Uh, so, quite a lot of demonstration there. I'll just pull back to the master slides to make sure we've got it clear. Uh, so, uh, just, I just, because it's a, a little quick in the demo, I've just tried to clarify it here. So, we've built this little model, I've, I've given it, shown you that we've got three different blank thicknesses. Um, uh, and then the modes, um, we get this classic potato chip mode, uh, and it's in a, in a paper way back in uh, 1999, these were first identified, but they're becoming quite a, quite a hot topic for EVs at the moment. Uh, so good to see that Master is, is, is all synced up with that paper. Uh, in a little bit more detail, I, I showed you that um, the different thicknesses give you uh, different frequencies, and you can really play with these these frequencies with the blank stiffness. Um, 
partly tuning, but also for weight, uh, people are really pushing for the, the, the thinner blanks. Uh, so actually, if you do a, a more careful study, um, you have to do a trade-off of the weight, which is good. Um, the misalignment from system deflection, if the blank's too thin, uh, will, will reflect misalignment, which will have a bad effect. Obviously, we need to check stress. Don't make it too thin, we have stress trouble. Uh, and then we also need to tune those dynamics to get a good dynamic mesh force. Uh, okay, so uh, this is just making sure we, we, we got what we saw there. So those two little peaks actually were the the, the gear web modes. Uh, and just a, It's very similar in the paper if you read it in detail, sort of ways in which it's presented actually, mesh compliance, very similar to, to master. Uh, Okay, so just to finish off that study uh, in a little bit more detail, um, this is quite complex and quite subtle, so I'll, I'll try and go slowly. Uh, you can see here what we aimed at to start with was to, to decrease the gear dynamic mesh force. Uh, so going from a no FE or a really rigid blank, you can actually choose some optimised blank thickness which changes the compliance and then for gives you a reduced gear mesh force. So you, you might think, well, that's great, my job's done. I've, I've reduced it from 10 to 2. That's a, that's a huge improvement. Um, but then you must carry on and you must start to look at, in this case, I've looked at the dynamic bearing force. You could go further and look at the, the casing accelerometer results. Uh, and actually, going from our original uh, very thick design to what I thought was my optimal design actually produces an increase in the dynamic force at the bearing, potentially an increase in the, in the casing acceleration. Uh, so what's the explanation? Um, it's that little bit I mentioned before about if you look at the, um, the FRF from the gear to the bearing, or you could look at the FRF from the gear to the casing, uh, that gives you the, the response from a, a unit dynamic force. And you can see, although we've decreased the dynamic force, we've actually moved the peak into a region where the, the transfer, transfer path is less favourable. There's more amplification. Uh, so I've ended up with a worse uh, dynamic bearing force. So that's a, an important thing to take away, uh, that you can work on the gear mesh force, but you also need to look at the transmissibility. So by making design changes to the compliance, you might reduce the, the mesh force, but you're changing the, the whole dynamic system by making those design changes, which could change your, your transfer paths. Um, it's probably worth noting that um, the very, very worst case scenario would be if you had a design where the gear mesh force had a peak and it corresponded with a peak in the transmissibility. So then they would be, you'd be max with max and you'd get the, the worst possible result. Um, Optimization wise you'd hope that if you spotted it, you could, you could change that relatively easy. If you had two peaks coinciding, you'd just need to, to separate them with some small design changes. Okay, uh, conclusions we'll come to later. I've gone a little bit too quickly, but I do have uh, some questions, and I do have a slightly better model to build up. So I'm just gonna uh, read the questions, because uh, some of you may all be asking the same questions. Uh, when will this recording be available online? Uh, that will be, I'm sure it will be available pretty quickly, a few days. And there's also a comment here uh, saying somebody's waiting for a parametric study webinar. So I've got a note here I'm supposed to read out anyway. The next webinar will be parametric studies in Master and Runner by Dr. Rupesh Patel on Thursday the 31st of May and uh, I think you'll know how to sign up because uh, you signed up to this one. Um, I've got a, a detailed question about seeing transmission error versus roll angle. Um, I may try if we have time. I'm sure we'll answer that via support pretty quickly afterwards. And Hello, are you providing the slides after the presentation? I will check with our, our marketing people. Um, there's nothing confidential in here. And I've got another question here. Can you explain a little bit more about gear to bearing FRS and how it affects the transfer path? Uh, can you explain the compliance to gear mesh force again? 
what input payload stiffness would you have chosen if the rotor shaft is modelled? Okay, I'll try and answer some of those. It's a good thing I went quick and oh, there's lots of questions coming in. <laughs> okay, I'm going to answer one of them, which is what I planned to do anyway, which was bring up master. Um, so uh, I'm just going to bring up a slightly larger model. Um, I didn't want to use the demo. Um, it's a little quicker than the smaller model. So one of the questions was what condition I would use here uh, if I've modelled the the rotor shaft. Uh, so uh, going back to design mode, um, I would still have zero torsional stiffness. I'm not mechanically grounded here, um, but most of the inertia will be modelled by this this shaft here. I think probably there's a little bit of an extra piece here because there's a correction. So this is probably the best way to model it in master as a, as a solid shaft, uh, which will then have um, a given inertia, but then maybe from the, the actual full CAD of the, the rotor, which is made of different materials, you'll have a, a polar inertia value. So by just adding a little bit of extra inertia, we can get it about right. Um, I think I've had discussions about how to model this structurally, I, I think it is best just to model it simply in master as a solid shaft. Um, to try and model the laminates is a, is a really big job and should be left to somebody in the in the rotor design department uh, to, to model more carefully. Uh, so, how to get the inertia values? I would hope the motor supplier could give you the the inertia. Uh, okay, I'm. I'm trying to take a lot of questions here, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll go slowly. Uh, how about the coupling between the housing modes and the gear shaft modes? Um, they would that would be that's a good question. So how about the coupling between the housing modes and the gear shaft modes? Um, they would be all in the model. Uh, so if you found modes in the housing which were close to modes of the shafts, uh, you could certainly move them and, and, and check what effect that had. Uh, you might think there might be some cooperation and that would be a bad idea. So there's this sort of concept of modal separation would apply there. Uh, okay. Um, what else do I have to say here? I opened this big bottle for another reason, but I'm reading too many questions. Okay, here we go. Yes. Uh, I should give a little correction. The, the, the demo model, we just modelled the blank in isolation. That, that's bad practice, I think. I think you should, for the FE for the, the blank, you should do it as one complete F, FE model for the whole shaft. Otherwise, you're, you're starting to make a, a, a connection between that FE model and the shaft in master, uh, an assumption. So it's best to model the whole shaft in FE. I'll just bring that up here. Uh, so, uh, I'm not sure what that's doing. Yes, in this case, you can see uh, we've modelled the whole shaft uh, in FE, so there's no question of how the blank is connected to the shaft. Uh, have a little quick look whilst I'm here at the mode to draw, mode 7. Uh, so, actually, if you model the whole shaft, you can see you start to get mixed up in the... This one. No, I'm just trying to make it a little bit clearer. Yeah, a little bit clearer. Uh, if you model the whole shaft, then you pick up the shaft bending modes as well as potentially that potato chip mode. So mode 7 looks more like a, a bending mode. Uh, let's have a little look. Uh, mode 8. Probably also bending in, in a different direction. And then mode 9. There we are, and there we have the potato chip mode. So it's still there, but I think you should do a better job of it by modelling the whole shaft. Uh, I'm trying to answer the, the questions I can answer now, <laughs> rather than the ones which are long and detailed. But people who have difficult questions or long questions, we will definitely get back to you, and we might arrange individual WebExes on uh, particular areas. Uh, 
Can you record an analysis modeling video so we can repeat? I guess we've we've recorded all this today. Uh, and we've done, yes, we've done modeling videos of various aspects in the past, so that, that would be no problem. Uh, ah, here's a good question. E-motor torque ripples uh, is an important question. I will, we're running out of time, but everything which I um, say here uh, can be done, uh, and I'll open a model for the electric motor, which is important. Um, uh, so I'm just going to uh, find an example uh, which has the electric motor model. Um, maybe just whilst we're... Oh, it's pretty quick. Okay, so um, yes, we can model the, the torque ripple excitation and the important also to model not just the torque ripple on the rotor but the, the forces on the stator teeth. So in fact, this model uh, has the, the stator model. Uh, I think if you zoom in here, you can see that we've, we've condensed this onto a, mode, a node on each tooth of the stator. So not only do you get a, a torque ripple here, you get varying loads on the stator, which can then excite the whole casing. Um, so just briefly, as we start to run out of time, uh, as I said, most of what I said still applies. We go to the same place, which is the gear harmonic ex excitation. Uh, and if I want to model what's going on, run. Then you can see here now, I mean, I, I could do the gear mesh as well, but I, I do just have the ability to just apply the machine dependent torque ripple and radial loads. Uh, and we should have a little look at what data has been used. Uh, that's important. Ah, uh, that comes up in a different place. Ah, works. Uh, so there you go. There is the, the torque ripple data. So um, this um, is brought in from Excel. So it, you can generate your, your ripple data uh, from uh, whatever um, electromagnetic simulation package you have or, or your supplier has, and you can bring it into master. Uh, this is showing the torque ripple. As I said, it's also important to consider the, the, stator, top, the stator teeth loads, uh, which also time vary and also excite the model. Uh, OK, uh, mm, getting short of time. I shall go back to my conclusions slide. Uh, just let me shut that. And as I said, it, it would, to run it, uh, it would, be, would be quite similar. Uh, and we could look at the dynamic response uh, at a bearing due to the torque ripple. Uh, so, or, or the casing. It's uh, uh, a little bit harder to calculate. Uh, so we get order cuts. So these are now excited by the torque ripple. Uh, so uh, hopefully that answers that question. Um, so I will go back to the conclusions. So just it's important to say we've we've covered gear wine. There's a lot there, and I've gone pretty quick. Uh, so any questions? We we're always proud of our support to existing users. We're always happy to engage with. Uh, new users and arrange individual WebExes to have a bit more time to explain more clearly. Uh, point out we do have time-stepping analysis capabilities, which is sort of marketed as driver, uh, which can be used to address other NVH issues, so driveline transients. Um, we're starting to work for customers on um, hybrid applications where you're, you're switching your power sources, which is quite a big transient. Gear rattle, we all know, has been around for a long time. Uh, I won't claim uh, we could solve it perfectly. I think time stepping analysis of rattle is hard, but we have something there, and customers have been using it as a tool. Uh, an interesting point is nonlinear analysis of gear wine uh, sometimes comes up. So what we've done today has all been frequency d domain. It assumes there's no lo loss of contact, etc. Uh, with the the time stepping domain. 
Uh, we could do it in a little bit more detail. I think it would be a mistake to, to jump to time domain from the word go because it's so much slower. You're being slower to run times. Your optimization will suffer. Your parametric study tools will stop, suffer. So the harmonic domain is definitely the place to work to start with, but could do a little bit more detail there for some real high fidelity work. Uh, any questions now? I've got a good list of questions and I'm running out of time. Uh, okay, and I'm sure somebody is going to ask me, or maybe they haven't, whether we have information on test versus master analysis for MBH. Um, I and we are trying really hard to get a good paper in place. Uh, we've seen loads of work with customers. Uh, work we've done ourselves where you get good correlation, um, not perfect but good, good enough to be a good tool for a project and we've had a lot of very successful projects. Um, to get to something I can share, share with you, uh, there's confidentiality issues for starters, so I'm in negotiations with some big customers where we've had good projects to, to, to work towards a paper which I can then share with you uh, and then as a second approach we are improving our lab facilities. So we may go right back to scratch and just build a, a rig of a single gear pair uh, and really do some careful test work and validation work. Um, so as I said, you've got a lot of questions, not all of which I've answered by any means. So uh, anything you feel hasn't been answered, get in touch with us via support. Uh, and uh, if you think of any questions afterwards, I've said a lot, you need time to think about it, then again, get in touch with us. Um, I think we are at the end of time, so I should stop. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for your time, everybody, and uh, good afternoon.